All right, everyone, thank you uh, for joining us here in the September um, edition of the Southern Fried DNN User Group meeting. We have a lot of information to go through tonight with uh, a presentation that I'm going to be going through uh, to really do a compare and contrast on evoke liquid content features and achieving the same types of features in DNN community and uh, kind of some uh, pros and cons between those two, compare and contrast. So that's our, that's our goal. We're going to go through that. But uh, as always, we start off our meetings with uh, a kind of a run through of community, run through of new announcements and releases. And uh, let's go ahead and dive right into that uh, very first thing so we can uh, talk about some of the exciting things that are going on that need attention. Um, to begin with, I, uh, of course, want to mention that we have DNN Summit. I'll, I'll go through and wake these guys up, too. Um, we have DNN Summit that is now open for registration, and that's probably the biggest new announcement of the day. Uh, that opened just a few days ago, and so now um, we have uh, registration officially open so that you can uh, not only purchase conference tickets, but also see the training courses that are being available and uh, presented this year and purchase those as well as your slopes tickets. Now information is still coming along and going to become more robust on the website uh, over the next few weeks, uh, so you can come here and find out even more information about it. Uh, but I did want to take just a moment to kind of uh, talk about the section that I'm in charge of. So you know, aside from purchasing conference tickets for the two-day event, uh, it's a good point in time for us to mention that there are some changes this year as far as DNN and training. DNN training always happens as the first day of the DNN Summit event, and uh, this year we have some different training courses that are being offered. Uh, so we have some of the ones that everybody knows and loves and are always full courses. Uh, we have the DNN Administrator Training. Um, I'll be leading that as a full one-day course um, that uh, agencies, organizations, governments, businesses, uh, different groups of folks who have people using DNN that need a deeper level of administrator training for those uh, users should consider coming to DNN Administrator Training because it's a walkthrough of everything about um, uh, being an admin um, from introduction to some deep dive. We have uh, introduction to DNN theming. Anthony Overcamp is uh, presenting that. Uh, he's done it a couple of years in a row. He is a fantastic um, instructor for learning how to stay modern and build themes skins uh, for DNN and stay up with not only current technology, but abilities that are in the platform that you're able to take advantage of to build the best themes that you can. Um, we are doing something different with DNN module development. Uh, that is always a very popular course, uh, but in years past, not only DNN Summit, but DNN uh, Con Baltimore and uh, all of the other ones that I've, I've been party to. Um, the course is always mixed. It's a full course. You can have 20 people in there, um, but often half the class needs an introductory level speed because they're just starting to work and become you know, module developers and work in DNN. There is the other half of the group who already have built a few things, and they are looking for a deeper dive in advanced <coughs> topics. And so both of those two in the same class, they have a mixture of getting a little bit of what they want but still needing more. Um, so this year, for the first time, we're splitting those into two separate courses. Uh, we have Will Stroll giving the introduction to DNN module development, and that is going to be uh, really a, a course that is paced for people who have never built a module before. They might be .NET developers, they might be new to .NET and are still learning their tool set and how they want to work on things within Visual Studio and just organizing their environment. Um, but they know a little bit about DNN, or maybe they know a lot about DNN, but this is still their first introduction into module development. That's the intro course for you. Uh, you've already spent some time building DNN modules. You've maybe already put together spa things, and you're wondering, what's the best way to do X, Y, Z? That's where you're going to jump into uh, Scott Wilkinson's advanced module development course. Uh, so between those two, we're serving that same audience with some more depth for each of them. That's so, nice. This is like one of the first times mm -hmm. that's happened, right? That I'm yeah. aware of. Yeah. It's the only yeah. time it's happened. And that's good because I've heard there can you know, yeah. fights on both sides. Right. Like, whoa, this is lower. People right. love yeah. the course, but they wish it went slower. Or they love the course, but they wish it went faster. Exactly. Every other time it's the other way. You know, yep. When it's set up to go yeah. kind of intro, you got the uh, 
Yep. The people who are disappointed in that. Went so to more advanced, so that's correct. Disappointed. So we're really uh, excited about that um, as being different uh, this year. Uh, we then also have a completely brand new um, course that is being offered for the first time. Uh, we are having a DNN Evoke focused training session uh, that is again going to be a full day uh, course, uh, and it is for. Uh, administration and liquid content introduction. Uh, so there's going to be, um, I would probably say about uh, a fourth to a third of it that's going to be evoke administration related. Things that are different from community. Maybe this is your first time being an, an administrator for evoke. There's some differences there. Uh, they're going to go through that and head towards the other um, three fourths of the, the content really being a an introduction into liquid content with tips and tricks, finishing with hands-on examples of building uh, and working on, on new, new things that they're developing uh, as examples uh, that are done in liquid content. Tonight's presentation is going to be talking a lot about liquid content. So if you watch this and you're interested and you want to learn more and get hands-on with an instructor there to show you examples and, and give you tips and tricks, this is definitely the course you're going to want. And that is uh, Tracy Wittenkeller who's uh, going to be presenting that for the first time this year. So uh, for our five courses here, we, I think we have a great lineup that has some more rich training than we've had uh, previously. So um, you know, the sign up is open for that. Uh, half day events that are happening at DNN Summit, we have two of them. Um, we have had the DNN Roundtable before. Uh, and that is always a favorite. Um, it is uh, where you get to come together with the rest of the community. I almost think of it as a face-to-face -face version of this, of a user group meeting because you get to trade questions and examples and talk about topics of the day uh, with the community. Um, so that is going to be a half day. Um, and then additionally, we have a new item that is half day. In the morning, we are having DNN Help Lab. Uh, Help Lab is a, a brand new offering. Uh, the concept of Help Lab is that you bring your site, you bring your questions, you bring something that's broken that you wish was fixed, you bring something that you want to know how to do differently and you've been you know, banging your head on it and, and it hasn't changed, come to the DNN Help Lab. Uh, by paying for a half-day event of DNN Help Lab, you are paying a fraction of uh, support time that you might spend with a consultant or with uh, you know, other uh, companies getting that type of advice and help and hands-on work. And the point uh, of Help Lab is that uh, Andrew Heffling, who's going to be running that. And he just joined. He just joined. Uh, perfect timing. Uh, is going to be on Hey, I'm here. <laughs> hey, Andrew. I've mentioned you by name. Um, so Dean and Help Lab, the point is you bring those questions. And if Andrew isn't able to help solve that, we will have heads in the room that can get on that. And if we need to, we'll go pull some people out of uh, other locations and bring the experts into the room to help work on that. Uh, and that's not just site related, that's also module development related because we will have folks there uh, that can uh, help answer, um, Andrew included, um, who can help answer development questions. So it's kind of twofold. It is a help lab. You bring your questions and problems, find, meet people who are going to give you answers and help fix it on the spot or set you on the right path. Uh, so that is the new offering of the DNN help lab. Um, as we get a little closer to Summit, we'll have Andrew on specifically to talk about it and help promote it. Um, but that's another one of the new things that we're doing this year that, uh, that I'm really excited about. Whew, that was a lot of words. Um, Clint, uh, anything else you want to mention about um, DNN and Summit? Uh, no, I, mean, I think you did a, a good job covering it. Um, we got more training. We got the Open Health Lab. We've got the slopes that we always have. Um, we have confirmation of keynote speaker, but I cannot say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know this this thing. Okay, that's good. This should be should be a good keynote. And All right, a lot of a lot of good content. So it'll be. Is it the person that you were reaching out to to think about doing they, or is it somebody else that I don't know? About? Uh, yeah, I think. All right, <laughs> redacted. India. Yeah. All right, I'm under NDA. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, um, speakers, could you mention? Uh, yes, I mean, we had to call for speakers. We actually need to take that off the website because it has now ended. And uh, Oh, is it today or, or no? It was Saturday. It was Saturday. Oh. Because, like, I, you know, I asked in today's meeting for the update of the number or whatever. Like, I think Stroll set the record and submitted 10 mm -hmm. sessions. Is Will Stroll on? No, he's not on, but we're thinking about accepting all 10 and just having a marathon stroll. Like, Will Stroll um, steps up to the plate. Um, everybody has to give him props. 
Yeah. We said we were wanting call for speakers, we were wanting quality content, we were wanting DNN focused content, and a lot of people were waiting to submit their sessions, and Will Stroll pulled out all the stops, and he submitted 10 sessions. And it's great to see Will back, you know, in that kind of role, because he used to be very active in speaking at user groups and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. online webinars and if hangouts. You're, if you're not familiar, Ryan, yes. did you say he submitted 10 sessions? He submitted ten sessions. Yeah. Oh my! I thought I submitted a lot. I did. I submitted five. That that also is a lot. That's a lot. That's half. You, you know, might have, have, have one room for one of them. I had to reach out to Mitch the next day because I didn't realize I submitted five. I thought I submitted three. Oh. And I, I looked through all my emails and I said, "Oh my gosh, I cannot do five sessions in two days." So I, I messaged <laughs> Mitch and said, "Just pick the best three or four. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, so. Uh, <laughs> so basically what we're saying is Will is not going to be available to party no. uh, at all. That's right, right. So. right. Oh, that's, oh, that's where I was going to go. Part of, I was going to say that Will, uh, Will is the father of community events. He put together the first uh, GNN uh, Day of Don Anouk. Uh, he also put together some of the first user group things. Um, there are several things where we look to Will as the uh, as the father of different things that he put together, and uh, submitting ten sessions is uh, exactly what we'll expect from him in the future. Not to, Every be, time. Not to be confused with daddy. I mean, right. I just, mm. Let's just make that straight. I I, father I, is okay, but I was trying daddy. to look for something you know, like OG, you know, um, the, uh, the <laughs> community. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> OG. Um, okay, so uh, anything else on DNN Summit? Otherwise, I'll uh, I kind of head on to some other community things here. That summed it up pretty good. All right. Some, Get it? Some. Uh, some. Uh, yeah. Some. It. Uh, oh. I'm nice. on a roll. Yeah. Uh, okie dokie. So, um, there's been some new uh, announcements and, and presentations from things in the community that I wanted to point out today as we got started because they're they're Hello. really Hello. they're really good. Um, they're they're really uh, impactful in the community. Um, uh, Addison has uh, released and, and started what he's calling Open Friday, and I want to promote that and mention it to everybody who's obviously watching things here live with us uh, tonight, um, but uh, anybody who's watching this video later on or running through the recap of things from SoFry, if you haven't checked it out, you need to check out Open Friday. Uh, basically, Open Friday um, is, you know, underneath of Addison and his company, uh, DeskPal. It's the virtual help lab. He has, yes, <laughs> absolutely. He has uh, set up. Um, a Slack workspace, so that if you want to join that Slack workspace, you can ask for help on any kind of topic. And, and he kind of explains it a little bit in this video, and I'll put the links to this in our recap of the meeting, but uh, uh, you know, that's also linked to from deskpal.com slash open, uh, so that you can see the video and watch it. But uh, essentially, he, he says, you know, you, you post questions out onto a blog or onto a forum or out onto Facebook and you're looking for some help on something, but you kind of just need immediate help. And maybe it's not a big enough question to bother putting out onto Facebook, but you just like to ask somebody to back up some ideas. Well, Addison commits that for a certain period of time, Friday mornings, he's going to be in that Slack workspace and some other people who've agreed to join and, and be there are just going to bring it up while they're doing their work. And if they see questions pop up that they can help answer, they'll answer those questions right there and then. So it's a direct helpline to some active DNNers who are doing their work every day, uh, you know, doing their normal day work. And if they can help answer a question, they will. But then you kind of also have a, a preset expectation you know, of when you're yes. going to get an answer. It's not yeah, all the time. time. Right. I mean, it's, it's not all the time, but Tuesday, it's just, you still have to wait until Friday morning for the to some extent, yeah. Unless somebody happens to be in there, they don't mind helping. Sure, right. To some extent, if you're not Addison, an you know, if, if nobody else showed up, Addison will be there on Friday mornings. Um, and I, you know, I should know the time, but I think nine. No, I'm sorry, ten to two, I think. Yeah, right. something like that. But that said, Eastern time. Uh, he's also invited more people to it. Uh, I just joined in, and after the fact, I answered a bunch of questions. So you know, yeah, I waved at you on Friday, but you didn't wave back. I don't oh. know what's the deal with that. <laughs> I think I, I, if I was online actively when it was, so that was time you, yeah, you, you actually joined towards the end, I think, didn't you? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, come on. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, Open Friday um, is definitely something that I think you need to pay attention to and participate in. Uh, especially if you have quick questions, it's a great place to uh, to go. 
Um, in other community announcements, uh, David Poindexter uh, posted just a few days ago a new release, a new um, article and information on Facebook uh, for NV Quick Persona Bar. And um, I'm going to kind of bring up the GitHub location and then pass it over to David to talk a little bit about this um, this project and this experiment where you are building Persona Bar related things, but you're also teaching us, you're teaching everyone a little bit of different ways you can approach these things, and it doesn't have to be as hard as we think it is. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that kind of drove me to do this, one, I wanted to learn a little bit more about extending the persona bar myself, but um, I, I think I was in a category of, of a lot of people when persona bar first came out. We saw the blogs by Ash and everything, you know, and, and hidden in there is some nice little gems that you may or may not pick up. I, I didn't pick on pick up on them very quickly at the beginning, but I was under the impression that I needed to know React, you know, in order to build a persona bar extension because all of the persona bar extensions that were in the React. core are built using components, React components in the DNN React common library. Um, and I, so I may be like a lot of other people, I just shot away from extending the persona bar. So I, the main driver of this was to, one, really understand kind of how it works. And I want to show examples because we just, I don't know of any out there that show how to build persona bar extensions in non-React based frameworks or no framework at all. And the very first project that's out there, these are not templates, by the way, and these are not uh, sanctioned by the core for anything like that or, you know. Uh, yeah. These, you, these, these, these are learning examples. These were intended as uh, quick start kind of projects that could be used for learning, but also maybe you could use these as quick start to kind of, you know, start your own little project. So I did an HTML-based one now. You don't have mm -hmm. to know any React whatsoever. In order to build the extension, it works right out of the box, and you can plop in your own HTML and put a little menu item in over there. And uh, but it's doing it, you know, quote the right way as far as how the architecture works. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a hack to right. put in something in there, uh, which there are ways to do that as well. Yeah. Um, but my next goal is to do one in Angular, a modern Angular um, extension. And then probably an Angular JS extension, a Vue JS extension, as well as uh, React as well, just to kind of show a good pattern. And so your GitHub location, you are putting all of them under the same repository, right. so that we yep. will have right now this simple HTML one, but then soon you'll have the yeah. next ones as you keep on going. That's right. All those other folders right now are empty, mm -hmm. but if you go into the simple HTML in there, you'll see. It's a full uh, Visual Studio solution, mm -hmm. including build scripts and all that for uh, creating your install package that will install just like any other uh, DNN extension module. Could I ask, Paleta, that you go ahead and build a release and also put it so that we have a release? That is a great point. Yes, I need to upload the actual release. That would be a great idea, right? right? I missed an important step. I will put yeah, it as an issue that you can then remember. Oh, yeah, I do that, please. Actually, Actually that'll help I will. you. I will. I will. Forget it. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't want to um, run away from that one too soon. Um, I really fully suspect that uh, another couple months down the line, we will have a quick persona bar presentation in which we deeper dive into these and show them as examples. So we will definitely be coming back to that, but that is available now um, as information for that HTML method. Hey, one thing before you jump to the next thing, uh, Daniel Vladis mentioned in the chat yes. that, uh, and this is a great point, I can't believe we didn't think about it, but he did a series of videos that are instructional on how to get up and running with your local dev environment for the NN platform and the admin experience. Yeah. So we need to mention that. It's um, on yeah. YouTube. It's a it's list. On the YouTube, playlist. It's a playlist, yeah. So if you want to like get in for YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. I, I think it posted a blog on it too. Yeah. Um, there's a playlist for so like getting started with DNN and GitHub or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. And do we do like, like community blog already? Can't remember how many hours of video his, it is there, but look on his name, name over there. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Romano, it's on the right. Up. Start, start with a D. Right. There you go. Yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, he's doing a good job taking notes on. Yeah, there you go. How to there contribute to DNN. Yeah. yeah. So definitely check that out because this is, I mean, Daniel put a lot of work into putting these together. And if you, you know, are interested at all at contributing in yeah. any shape, form, or fashion, this is worthy uh, to uh, go and watch his videos and uh, follow along. You know, this uh, this series of videos uh, looks like it would be the next uh, replacement series of videos after my last uh, training series of videos that I was watching from uh, from Mr. Patterson over here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How did you watch it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, this, this is very nice. So I did like 23 or 24. That's right. Entries. Mine were like probably more wide size in comparison to yeah. the other. Mm -hmm. Longer in nature, yeah. but it's good because it's thorough. Man. So, yeah. So, D Daniel is doing this, puts together this video, also is putting together a record number of Mod older core modules brought up new. He's not sleeping. He's, he's not. not hey, he put, a, he put a pull request for MB Quick theme today. So, <laughs> uh, you know, yep. knows for the tag meeting. All right, I'm uh, pretty sure he's Superman. This guy's the thing of life. Daniel, if you're coming to Dean and Summit, did you submit uh, 10 sessions for speaking? I think you could do it. I am not coming, unfortunately. Oh, oh man. You could do that. So, Ryan, right. I, I want to remind you from last year, about this time, I said the same thing. And then Clint had a phone call with me for DNN Digest <laughs> and then changed my mind. And I, I, I somehow ended up doing a presentation. Yeah, this is also true. You you came mm -hmm. and, and there was a presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, Daniel. Watch out, Daniel. We'll, we'll have Clint call you shortly, and we'll change the mind. All right. So uh, yeah, but more just, in just to finish on that series of videos, I really started from zero. So you know the tooling you need and how to set up your environment. And there's an example for the core, the persona bar, and the uh, and the module. Uh, mm -hmm. Very basic, but at least it starts from zero because there's a lot of assumptions sometimes in mm. instructions yeah. that you know something and something very basic you might not know. So it really starts from zero. This is really fantastic. Um, we're going to have Charles run through this. Um, okay, so uh, you know, just uh, picking out another few things uh, before I pass to Clint and David to see other community stuff. Um, I took note earlier this week that we have a new program, I guess to call it, um, that is uh, needing some attention and some promotion. Uh, we now have the first annual uh, DNN Website Awards. Uh, this is uh, something that's coming out of the um, Foremost Media. Uh, Foremost Media, but it's, it, if, me if I'm wrong, it was coming yeah. out of the Awareness Group as, as a, an initiative out of the Awareness Group, right? Yeah, and he took the ball around. That is fantastic. So they announced this uh, opening for uh, DNN Website Awards. Uh, heads the website. It's a, it's a catchy-looking, pretty website of itself. Um, but they are uh, requesting entries all the way up to the end of next month, October the 31st. And uh, there are a few types and a few different pieces of information. But you submit uh, your sites, and uh, they really want to get <laughs> as many sites as they can uh, in, in there. Um, so it's, it's kind of the first type of thing like this that we've had community, you know, open community-wise. And uh, so we want, really want to see a lot of people using it and, uh, and submitting entries and then uh, obviously come back and, and have people come on when we're talking about uh, looking at the winners. And you can see, like, they're posting the ones that are submitted. So, like, you could go to the site and look That's at the true. entries. And they've got a Facebook page where every entry they, like, share it. So yep. that's job. a very good point. Even just submitting gets you some promotion for the websites that you've put together. I wanted to know if this website has been submitted to this website for the award. Yeah, I would imagine it'd have to be. I mean, it's, it's come on, it's got SVG tracing on it. I mean, yep. how quick is that? that? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just scrolling down so we see the activity that's going on on the site. Yeah. <laughs> um, view entries. Right, right, yeah. So we have categories uh, here. There's B2B, B2C, government, nonprofit, self-promotion, and then industry uh, within service industry. Um, and you are able to vote um, on your, your favorite entries. Uh, but you see here that we've kind of got those already broken out. Not a lot of entries yet. I'm sure 
that as we start to see more show up, people will, uh, I don't know, uh, get excited about it and start putting in their own posts. But um, already a fair amount of good promotion uh, posts uh, that have been submitted, but uh, we've got a, a month and some change to keep on submitting. <laughs> um, what's the difference between business to consumer versus self-promotion? Self-promotion is more like um, uh, your own. I'm an artist. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An artist website. Your portfolio yeah. website. You're a photographer. You're doing your own. Well, so and, and your uh, mission there is not for consumers, potential consumers to see. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, uh, a red banner <laughs> on the, yeah, we're going to come back to that in just a second. And it's, actually, this would be the time to do it. Um, there is a uh, notice that is up on the DNN software website um, for the fact that the main DNN software website will undergo maintenance on Monday uh, in the wee hours of the morning. So uh, there is a notice up for that. You uh, might want to fix the highlighting on there. Yeah. Just saying. Oh, it's gone now. Huh, interesting. Hmm? Completely not getting it. You're highlighting it and it makes it hard to read, so I was like, you know, oh, I the highlighting there. Okay. <laughs> I'm, All right. Right. I'm trying to be a funny. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, yeah, deer and headlights. Um, uh, anything else out of the community blog that we need to uh, call uh, attention to? We that's have... a good blog there that Clint just put out. Tag meeting? No, the, uh, oh, the oh, .NET Foundation. <laughs> uh, five reasons why we're glad to be part of .NET Foundation. It's a great blog. Yeah, I mean, you know, we joined the Dotnet Foundation right. like about a year ago, and people like even Dennis Shaw told me it's like I really didn't totally understand what all that meant. He's like, but after reading the blog, it kind of helped. So, and that's like I just highlighted five things that I felt were easily identifiable. Like, if you're a community member, including um, us, you know, mm -hmm. what we get from yeah, them, so yeah, that's really yeah, even embedded one of your tweets, um, but uh, or a screenshot of your tweet. But anyways, uh, they offer more resources than just these. But, you know, as much support as they're giving us, I'm just trying to give them a little promotion. And that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you meant my tweet. Got it, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if uh, some of you were on a few months back. Um, I have this packet of things that I'm going to be sending out to people that I did get addresses from. Andrew, you were one of them, for instance. Um, but I have some more swag coming in, and I want to get it all in before I, I send it out. So uh, that, will, that will come through. So, so the question, Ryan, I have is, is the C-sharp robot there? I mean, the .NET robot? Yeah. All right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, do you want one of the shirts? You got them. And I'm going to be snagging some stuff. Or do you mean the actual robot? Who is so that no? <laughs> is the actual well, robot? Well, uh, I, I guess I can ask Clint to make the actual robot. Well, you just missed uh, the fact that last year for DNN Summit, I, wait, or the year before that, year before that, I made uh, a .NET lightsaber. Uh, so this little guy holding the lightsaber on the cover of the magazine, he, he wasn't holding my lightsaber, but he should have been. Uh, because I made a purple one. I made a purple one, and they went out to the first uh, keynote speaker that we had. Um, all right, folks. Uh, I'm going to get through this because we've got interesting stuff to uh, get into, but I have two more points in community that I want to uh, run through. Um, another one is uh, from David, in that uh, there's been a release now of NV Quick Pulse. I think we talked about it briefly in one of the last user group meetings, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I want to go ahead and mention that it is uh, released, and we have this information here in the blog post. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, David will give you some details. It is a mobile app that you can run that will tell you about updates, about things that are out there in open source releases, um, and uh, it's a quick and easy way to see details that you don't normally see. So that's a, you summarized it very well. The best it's available on the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So, you know, it, the, I will say the project itself, the code base for the mobile app, is completely open source and on GitHub. And this was meant to be a starting point. So if there are statistics or new features that you'd like to see on there, we'll treat this just like any other open source project, log your issues. If you can contribute, great. It was built on Ionic, uh, kind of a combination of Ionic 3 and Ionic 4, 4, not 4. Um, and uh, so if you know some Angular and stuff like that, you know, jump right in. be fun. If you don't, and let's say you speak another language, one of the things I will mention, it has localization built into it or internationalization, or how you want to look at it. So at minimum, you know, help with some of the translations because they're just we'll JSON files. Uh, Everything's in English right now, but upgraded 
JSON files for a lot of languages, and we can add more. So the more, the merrier on that. If you've got a few minutes, it probably will only take you 10 or 15 minutes to translate the entire JSON file that's there for all the uh, text that's used in, in the uh, app that will help some people uh, that are uh, non-English speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I'll finish with a bit of a teaser. Um, it was mentioned to me that uh, just before the meeting that uh, Kelly Ford has been working for a little while on uh, a release that's coming up, some, some new information and some new announcements that are going to be focusing around uh, DNN docs and uh, documentation. And if you want to be uh, ready to participate and, and uh, ride the wave when, uh, when that happens here in the next, what, you said several weeks, month, what are we talking about? Soon? Soon. All right, soon. Um, <laughs> then you should go back and read Kelly's first two blog posts uh, about this. Uh, there's one where he talks about uh, DNN docs and uh, the progress towards, uh, but then also a little bit of a, a, uh, an information about what makes good documentation, uh, which would be an advising towards you if you are going to participate in helping improve DNN documentation in the future. So that's, uh, that's what we're talking about, and it, it'll happen soon enough, and when, the, when it does, uh, we'll have Kelly on to present and talk about that if we can get a hold of him. Um, but, uh, you know, go ahead and start reading up uh, to prepare yourself for uh, some exciting stuff ahead. No, sir? Yeah, we, we may should give Mitchell a shout-out because she put on Facebook that it's a girl. Oh, that's right. Oh, Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah. Mitchell Sellers, everybody. He put time out of his flight schedule to make a Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, um, well then, unless there's anything else community related, I'm going to jump into the main portion of uh, presentation. Uh, that, that was a good meeting tonight. Yeah. That was a <laughs> solid meeting right there. <laughs> just by itself. Half an hour of, uh, of community, and that's also a testament to how much is going on. I mean, mm -hmm. we can't pat ourselves on the back enough to say that there's a lot of stuff going on in the community, and there's more stuff going on all the time. And uh, you know, this wasn't always something you could say in recent history, but there's so much stuff going on, you can lose track of all the new stuff that's going on. Because yeah, um, the manager's got a whole fire. So, um, you know, it's a good thing for the community that there is so much stuff going on. Um, well, tonight we are going to do a run-through of information that I have presented a few different times to uh, clients and to folks when I'm doing consultation work when we're talking about how you do things and, and approach things with an idea or a mindset of creating structured content that you are going to power through DNN. And we're going to do it, I'm interrupting myself before I even finish this sentence, but <laughs> basically I'm going to give a, a more formal uh, put together presentation at DNN Summit on this topic. So what we're looking through today is some of the information that I've pulled together, some of the screens that I'm going to be running through. And uh, you're, you're getting the, uh, the initial run, and I'll be honing uh, those details and, and you know, putting more into it uh, with details, uh, ex more hands-on examples uh, by the time we get to DNA Summit. So let me get it straight. You're practicing. Yeah. practicing. <laughs> this is just the <laughs> raw <laughs> bits and pieces. You guys, put it together. you guys are my uh, focused research group. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh, I've got a question. Matt. Are you introducing the future speaker, or do, do we need to do that? Ha! I've, I've introduced the feature speaker. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Moore with More Creative Company, and uh, there we go. And he does a lot of structured content stuff, so he knows what he's talking about. I, 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 I do. That, that's a really good point. And, and I'll elaborate on that in just a second, too, because um, we're going to talk about what structured content is. We're going to give a little bit of, we're going to give a little bit of an introduction on several different topics tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about structured content and what it is and what, why this idea as a buzzword is, is around right now. We're then going to go into DNN, Evoke, and we're going to talk about liquid content. We're going to give an introduction to liquid content and how you can achieve a few different things and some limitations that exist within liquid content. We're then going to look at the exact same type of things, the approach that you need to take if you're going to do the same things in DNN Community Edition with a few different third-party modules. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about um, Xmon Pro. We're going to be talking about um, Dean and Sharp's Endpoint API. And we're going to have those a, a way to achieve the same type of things as liquid content. And we're not going to get terribly deep into any of those, but we're going to cover introduction topics or points in, in all of them um, so that you'll get an idea of where you should go research. If you've been thinking about doing more with structured content, you want to start using this 
and you're not sure what direction you want to go. You're not sure what limitations there might be that are going to stop you from going down one path A versus path B. That's what we're going to be talking about uh, here tonight. Um, the blog post that will go up after this will include all the links, all the pages, and examples for these things uh, so that you'll be able to follow through in even more detail and continue that research on your own uh, afterwards. So um, to jump in, just, just to begin with, um, let's talk about structured content and let's talk about liquid content uh, specifically. I'm going to come back to this uh, main page of the um, public website uh, where it talks about uh, liquid content. But, oh, these guys keep, oh, no, these guys went to sleep. I didn't wake them up earlier. Let me wake up a few ahead of me and I'll come back. Did you know you can play a game at that point? What is that? Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah. It's fun. No, I didn't. They just made it cutesy the other day. I, I kind of preferred it before it was cutesy, but still. Um, okay. So um, basically, uh, it was uh, you know a little more than a, a year ago that um, liquid content first came to the forefront of attention that I started paying attention to it. Um, there were articles like this on CMS, uh, CMS Connected where um, Will Morganwick was uh, being promoted uh, for going around to talk about DNN 9.1 and the release of that and the release of liquid content. And there was a lot of initial buzz and initial um, push to people who hadn't thought about doing structured content with DNN as the core um, that you're going to manage and control your content uh, content through. And so um, I'll leave it to some of these uh, articles and uh, you know, video uh, for you to get more about the view and the idea. But that's integral when we talk about structured content. And it's the idea of multi-channel publishing. Uh, there are some phrases or things that you'll run across uh, whenever you hear people talk about structured content. And they will uh, talk about structured content as being a way for you to publish once and use multiple times. The idea is you prepare a set of content, data, information, and you prepare it regardless of where it's going to be displayed and what it's going to look like. The style, the design, the layout, all of that is separate from just having your data. And that's the core concept of, of structured content. There's more of it uh, that gets into formatting your content, uh, your data very well, and organizing and having a plan for how you put your, your content together. But as an example for, um, for structured content, I like the example that's, uh, that's given here uh, on a particular website that's talking about what is structured content and where does this idea come from? Because it's a relatively new buzzword, but the idea has been around for a long time. The idea of having a normalized database with a good data structure is just good planning. That's just good data management. But this idea that you can then produce that and you have done a good job with your data, you don't care where it's going to go. That might be a newer idea uh, to some folks. So in this example, uh, they say that imagine that your content is water. That water is still water no matter whether it's poured into a glass or a plastic bottle or into a bowl. It's still water. It takes the shape of where it's going for presentation. It takes the shape of where it's going because it's gone into that location and now it molds itself to fit that location. But it doesn't change the fact that it's water. That's what you're doing when you think about structured content. You are thinking about, you are thinking about data and doing it right for data's sake regardless of where it's going to go and be presented. And when you start thinking about saving your data in that kind of way, then you are prepared to start um, presenting that content in any number of locations and have that content be designed and laid out and presented well in those locations. So if we're talking about having DNN be the heart of our media publishing, then we are using liquid content or other means here with, uh, with modules that are helping us build that same set of tools that liquid content presents so that you can put all of your information into your DNN website and that information will go into a mobile device because it is pulled by a third party um, uh, mobile app. It goes, of course, onto desktop, so it goes into your one website, but maybe you have three other websites, um, and some of them aren't based in DNN. They're in other locations and other types of systems. 
Well, they can still use the APIs to consume that data and present it just like you've been managing it and maintaining it and keeping it correct. But DNN is your heart. It's serving up that location of, uh, as being the central location for that data to be served up to wherever it's going to be consumed. So uh, the idea there is publish once and use uh, or utilize multiple times uh, across multiple different you know, types of uh, recipient location, website, mobile apps, watches, uh, Alexa. Um, some of the examples that we'll, we'll get to in a few minutes are some, some nice examples where um, Alexa has been used, um, uh, Amazon Echo, uh, so that you can present some data that it can respond to and have in some commands. So there's um, some fun stuff that's been done, um, but I'll leave these links for, for more more reading, uh, but the idea for structured content, if, if I got it across, is you are doing a good job with your data and you are not worrying about where it's being consumed or what it looks like. You're just organizing your data the best that you can. Now, at the core of everything, DNN is going to then be saving this data and it's going to be served out uh, in a, a DNN API. Uh, we'll talk about the options there with those APIs. Uh, but I need to go ahead and mention at this point that uh, we'll have uh, in, in display today and, and running through things, uh, one of the tools that's really helpful for doing testing work and initial playing around with APIs, uh, and that's an application called Postman. Uh, Postman makes it very easy for you to put in an API and put in whatever um, values you have to put to that API to then see the results coming back. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, as we go through uh, things today. Um, talking about the different tools that we're going to be using and the things that we're presenting, if on one side of the conversation we're going to be talking about um, DNN Evoke and liquid content for serving up this data and being the, the presentation uh, of this data through API and going through the liquid content DNN endpoint, um, then we're talking about uh, liquid content on one side. If we're talking about community level, you can do the same things. Uh, so as this... Um, buzzword of uh, structured content started coming out and liquid content was being promoted. Um, it was very exciting, but at the same time, we were easily aware we've been doing the same thing for ages with DNN before liquid content. Um, in that, if you set up your data and you set up the structure of your data well, it's going into your SQL database and you are creating managers for people to edit and um, manage that data. And then you're consuming it on your website because you're displaying it on your website but you don't have to just display it there. You can have RSS feeds, and people are going to pull that data into RSS feeds. You can have page-level content scrape. If you're going to do a very manual type of Ajax scrape of content, there's, there are lots of ways, without getting fancy, to have DNN be the source of data that is presented in other locations. Um, but one of the tools that makes it very easy to create a modern API and to have a lot of features that you don't have to build yourself uh, is to look to a module like DNN Sharks Endpoint API. Um, so obviously, when we're talking about .NET development, you can build your own APIs. You can roll your own and create whatever you need to. But for this presentation, for, for the compare and contrast, I think that DNN Sharks Endpoint API is a really good toe-to-toe -to -toe comparison because if we're thinking about who can use liquid content, we're thinking about people who may not be full-on developers. They're not touching .NET code. They're touching HTML code, and they're making templates. We're going to walk through those. Mm -hmm. But we're not expecting them to dive in and do .NET development. Well, if I'm looking for a comparable alternative to say, okay, if someone's using liquid content, what's the op uh, alternate to that? DNN um, Sharp's Endpoint API is a good uh, one because you are doing point and click within an interface to set up some very complex, robust, and secure uh, APIs. So uh, we'll be talking a good bit about DNN Sharp's uh, Endpoint API. Uh, we will um, also be talking about uh, XMOD Pro. And this is the point in the presentation where I mentioned that we, you know, my, my company, More Creative, we use XMOD Pro heavily. Um, it is, for us, the best way to build customized solutions uh, in .NET Nuke all the time. We, we tell people that DNN is our application uh, development platform in which we build solutions. XMOD Pro is one of the most important elements in the toolkit that we take to every DNN website um, because 
it allows us to quickly build forms, to quickly build templates for display of data. And when you have forms editing data and templates displaying data, you put those two things together and you have everything you need to edit data and present data within the DNN website. But, of course, no code. Uh, and, but you do need to know code. It is, it is, some it is, some it is a manual process to build and do and develop. Um, however, this doesn't have to only be done in something like Xmont Pro. You could use other DNN Sharp tools. Um, Action Grid and Action Form are the comparable thing there of forms and lists. You could also use, I point over to Clint because he's a fan of it, um, forms and lists. You don't have to use anything else. Um, you can certainly use a two section content to do these same types of things. Um, two section content has its own API uh, elements to it. Um, so the list goes on and on. You can use other form editing and list displaying things uh, to help you use in this situation to build and do uh, in .NET Nuke, same things that we're doing inside of Liquid Content. Myself, we use Xmont Pro, and um, I think I'm going to show some, some fairly good benefits and features of using Xmont Pro as we go through, but it's not the only tool that you have to use. Um, okay, so uh, to begin with, let's talk a little bit about um, Liquid Content and Evoke, and let's talk about some of the features that are present inside of Evoke um, and Liquid Content specifically. I'm going to run through points, and as we go through, we'll, we'll mention points about liquid content, we'll mention points about the community of edition, and I'll kind of finish by describing some of the pros and cons of each. There, there are definitely pros and cons on both sides here. This isn't, this is good or this is bad. This is, if you have this set of needs, this is a good match for you. If you have that set of needs, this other is a good match for you, and you might feel hampered in choice A versus choice B. So. Um, this really isn't meant to be bashing one thing or another thing. This is talking about the elements of the tools and seeing what's available and what makes the best fit for client needs. And when you're dealing with structured content, planning ahead and thinking about the pain points you're going to have later, if you can spend that time just planning it out just a little bit, that will save you hassle down the road. Uh, because if you spend a year building into liquid content, and you find that you really have some requirements that aren't met by liquid content, it's going to be some mess to get out of that and then build something else. So if you spent that time in the beginning making some choices, uh, that would have helped you out. Um, so uh, some things about liquid content um, uh, to begin with. Uh, number one, uh, liquid content only exists inside of uh, DNN 9. Uh, so it's not available for older versions of DNN. This is a new uh, element that is available for DNN 9. It is in... Uh, DNN 9 um, evoke uh, content and um, engage, right? And then it is also in, obviously, the uh, uh, on-cloud uh, instance of those. Is so basic? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Don't know. I, I will know by the time I do this for something. I'll be more specific about it. One of the uh, points about uh, this is that for connecting to the, uh, for connecting to the data of, um, of liquid content stored information, regardless of whether you have your DNN instance, DNN 9 instance on a local on-premise location, your liquid content data is stored outside of your local instance. It is not stored in your local SQL Server database. It is stored in Azure within DNN corporates um, uh, Azure data location. So liquid content uses an API that is out there and it stores its data in a location that is out there. So that is one of the starting points of information that uh, that everybody needs to know. Uh, I've been asked, you know, where is this? You know, where, where is this located? Uh, and so it is um, on uh, it is on Azure and uh, it's technically in Document DB. Uh, so that is where your data is being stored and what what it is being stored in. Um, you do not have direct access to that data. The only way to access that data is through liquid content to pull down data or to put up edits and changes to that data. Uh, so you are using liquid content and the API as your interface uh, to and from, uh, from that data. So I have uh, you know, some articles and things that are uh, information about that. Um, we're going to come back to this point, which is talking about API aggregation and aggregating multiple sets of data together. Um, because that is the crux of one pain point uh, that I'm going to use in my examples uh, here today. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of put a bookmark and I'll come back to that if, if it makes sense in the conversation uh, to talk about the idea that when you call APIs, if you need multiple sets of data together, you either need to call multiple APIs and then in programming on your side where you're receiving the data, combine together and aggregate on your own. Or if that isn't practical, uh, then you need to look at API aggregation to aggregate that data before you consume it and before you use it. And sometimes you don't have that flexibility. Uh, so it's, it is one of the points that we're going to be talking, talking about and heading towards. Um, now, before we dive into actually looking at, uh, at, at liquid content inside of DNN uh, 9 instance, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the resources that are out there and available to not only help you get started with this, to help you see examples of things that you can do, um, and also the documentation that goes along with it. Uh, I've got two or three more screens that we're going to take a look at. Uh, to begin with, uh, there's a, a very good uh, slide share that, uh, that I looked to originally. Uh, that talks about building sites and using liquid content and how to work through it. Uh, this was produced originally by Blue Bolt, um, so I'd like to you know, promote that as being a very good slide share that kind of tells you a little bit about liquid content, what to expect out of it, and some things you should think through. Um, that one of the slides that I really liked was a, a bit of um, a bit of an explanation. And notice, and notice too, there's the water example there. Um, but a little bit of planning to say what you should be doing and what you should be looking for as you plan what you're doing with your, with your data. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, it's too, too many slides for me to go through and find, but uh, basically he talks about pain points you should think of before you get started building your data. Um, and I really appreciated that, so that I'll, I'll have that link to that slide share. Um, Builtwithdnn.com is a website that posts examples and information of things you can do with liquid content. So if you're on the shelf, if you're you know, listening to this presentation and you're thinking, what can I really do with liquid content? Why is this important? These are some good real world examples of things you can do if you're thinking about it the right way with structured content and API. Um, one of my favorites, and I'll kind of, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'll kind of just give you examples and saying that, you know, they're thinking about building carousels or tracking, they're building, um, you know, things that are being consumed by Android apps that are being managed and, and controlled through your DNN site, um, mobile games. Um, thinking about multi-channel publishing means that you're reaching any different type of system that's going to need to present data. You're using DNN, which is great at managing data, to do what it does best, allow people to manage data. Um, one of the showier examples is from Joe Brinkman, uh, was put out a while back. Uh, but he talks about how to use liquid content to uh, create a uh, term that can be queried on uh, Amazon Echo by talking to Alexa and fetching data, and that data is controlled by your DNN website. So this is a really good um, hands-on, real-world example of something that you could do uh, that's fun, too. Um, the Documentation Center, uh, the DNN Documentation Center, has a lot of good information about the things you can do and, and how you do them and the, the help information uh, for everything from templates uh, to the APIs. And we will spend some more time coming back uh, in this uh, specifically to the APIs so that we can take a look at what's available from that API um, and what data you can put in and what data you can get out of it. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the, uh, the slides kind of that I've prepared. Um, my experience with working live online is that anytime you give a site a chance, something's going to go wrong and bomb on you. Uh, so we're going to be running through these as screenshots from presentations from sites that I've uh, worked on this data with. Um, but before I kind of continue along, um, David Clint, I'm not watching the chat. Is there are there any questions so far about structured uh, content? Uh, in no general? All right, good deal. Um, applicable comments. Andrew's a little <laughs> his feathers are ruffled because you keep calling it document DB. Microsoft rebranded it to Cosmos or something. It's know. not a rebrand, it's a swap. Uh, and I have an article about that. Dear document DB customers, welcome to Azure Cosmos. <laughs> but currently the thing is not on Cosmos that I'm aware of. It's still on Document DB. Isn't that the case? Well, they technically are two different things. Uh, <laughs> but they're but they're the same. But they're the same thing, all right. They're different, but they're the same. It's yeah, oh, it's weird. 
Oh, wow. I completely um, am, am thrilled to say I don't know enough about that. It's kind of like the Trinity, I guess, the, 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 the duo, <laughs> duo entity. Duality? <laughs> Duality. Duality, yeah. Duality, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, diving in to liquid content, because we're going to do this in, in parts. We're going to start off with liquid content, and then we're going to move over to community, and we're going to do uh, our different things in, uh, in that side. Starting off with liquid content, we are going to run through things, and we're going to finish by coming back to Postman. So I kind of start off with this screen to say that we're going to take a look. Is there any way you can make that one bigger, maybe? It was bigger on my other monitor, and this is about as big as I've got it, unfortunately. I am not sure what I, I can really do. Oh, that's good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Then as we go through, I'll zoom in and out a, a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to end up being in Postman, and we're going to talk about the data that's coming out of, of the API. Um, Postman is a really good tool for testing and looking at things. And if, like me, you're, you're wanting to just talk about the concept of, uh, you know, looking at this data, then Postman is a great way to do that because you can see a specific um, query and then you can see the records and the data that's coming back to that in, uh, in a JSON format. Um, so we're going to uh, spend time you know, going through and coming back to that. So jumping into liquid content and what it, what it looks like inside of the system, uh, when you're in Evoke, you're going to content, and instead of going to pages and uh, getting into normal traditional modules, uh, you are going into the content library. That content library, uh, when you first go to it, it asks if you want to do content library management. <coughs> you say okay, and you're on your way to begin uh, working inside of uh, inside of liquid content. So everything inside of uh, content library really is your whole liquid content section. Um, as we take a look at it, the very first thing you see is the content tab, where you can see all of the articles, form posts, um, gallery photos, anything that has been produced that is liquid content is going to be showing up inside of this list of, of content. Um, there are some, uh, some things about it that, that are worth pointing out or mentioning, but um, one of the main is that this is the main view for you to see all of the items that have been created uh, inside of your DNN instance in liquid content, and it's a pretty small area. So that's a point to mention. Um, if you have hundreds of articles, uh, then you're going to start off by seeing the top six, and you can click load more to continuously load another set, and then another set, and then another set. But if you have hundreds of articles, uh, it is a small little window viewport uh, for you to be editing inside of. Good thing they didn't give you another way to access the data. <laughs> um, so if you are uh, looking inside of this, uh, there are some quick ways for you to get down to the content that you're wanting to search for or edit or work on. Uh, one of them is filtering. So you can filter by your content types. We'll talk about content types in just a moment, but uh, imagine that you've set up some things that are blog articles and you've set up other things that are slide rotators to go onto the home page of your site or the first screen uh, or about screen of a mobile app. Your idea is you set up uh, graphics and slides, and you set up articles. Well, those are two different content types in most circumstances. They don't have to be, but we'll talk about that in a second. So um, you can have an article content type, and you can have a slide content type. So filtering down to a specific content type will shorten your list of everything being seen here. Um, the search is pretty robust. Uh, it does allow you to, um, you know, to type in, and as you start typing, it'll start filtering right there, so it's very quick for you to do a search. Um, and the other thing to mention, too, is that um, searching by tags is a big deal, and filtering by tags is a big deal instead of liquid content. So we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a moment, um, especially as we're creating new content. Um, but uh, taking a look at this, uh, still giving this overview, we have content as the first tab. Um, if you do go into one piece of detail, or one article, for instance, then you get to see the data that you've created for this article. So here we're taking a look at a blog post, and we can see the, the title of the blog post. We can see um, the uh, date published, the date updated, um, some information about it, meta title, all of these things that if I was to scroll through and see the details in this article, they are all things that were set up for us in the content type, and we'll dive into that. But, you know, if you click to edit a piece of content, you are editing the records in the database, if you're imagining it that way. Uh, so this includes the primary picture and the title and the author and the, um, you know, related articles and anything else you want to put to it inside of the content. Now, content types are your different types of 
Okay. Um, my best analogy there is to say that you can certainly reuse things for multiple purposes if you plan for it ahead of time. So if you build several questions and put them together as a content type to say that it's going to be a slideshow, that might include data elements like the title of the slide, text that appears on the slide, a link, and the link text that appears on the slide, and then more importantly, the picture of the slide. Those might be the fields that you put into a content type for a slide. But for an article, you might put together things that are article related, the introduction, the body of the article, the closer of the article, a call out quote, the author of the article, um, other data related things like published dates, uh, you know, active and inactive dates, um, uh, an active or inactive checkbox, um, uh, drop down list of possible authors, links and cross reference links to other related articles in the same series. You can start thinking about things that are available in data sets when you deal with articles. Now, does that mean that you do that when you're creating a blog? content type. <coughs> what if you then also have an FAQ? Okay, you could create a new FAQ as another content type. And then you have things about an FAQ. But at the same time, you could use the article content type for FAQ. If within that data you have a drop down that allows you to specify a category and you say that the category is FAQ versus article versus blog post versus testimonial, you can start thinking of using an article for multiple different types of things, and there's no right or wrong. In a sense of data and purity of data, build what makes sense to you and what makes sense for keeping your, your data organized. But know that when a, an administrator is going to manage that content, when they click to edit a record, uh, as David was pointing out in the beginning of the, before we started the meeting, when, a, when a, an editor clicks to work on that content, they're going to see all of the fields, all of the questions that you've prepared in this content type. So if only half of those fields are applicable in a fact usage versus in an article usage, maybe you're bending it too far. Maybe you should create two different content types. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe an article is part fact and part article, and having it in one record makes a lot of sense great, then think about doing that and building those fields and building those items in. Um, so that's kind of my soapbox for talking about data. And within our organization, that's part of where I lean on Dustin, to talk about what's proper in a normalized database structure and, and in relationships. So we talk about cross-reference tables and what should be in them and what should not be in them and what's in our, in our main data table and what's in subsequent data tables. You think through all of that. You're planning it out on paper, probably, before you even start putting this together in, in content types. Now, we'll do a deeper dive and, and talk about this uh, in more details in a few minutes. Um, yeah, Ryan, but that's one a question good that came in, to yeah. you, you may know the answer to. Uh, can you do custom validation on fields? Uh, it's a beautiful question. And when I get into the deeper dive, uh, we'll show you what is available in validation and in data types uh, because there's a, there's a specific set of field types that are available and a specific set of validations that are available. Um, and if you were thinking about bullet point lists of things that Liquid Content has, is it has a very simple, straightforward set of fields available and a very simple, straightforward set of validation available. If what you need doesn't fall in to those fields or those validations, then you need to do something different. There is not an ability to add in robust other field types or other validation types. Can't do it in the template? So, I mean, like the main three, the main you know, like got a regex? <laughs> Surely that covers the majority of everything. You could put front end validation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You like could put front end validation that's, that's JavaScript related. Yeah. <clears throat> no problem. But that's Three. not data side. Right. And one of the things that you'll find with other systems, like if we talked about XML Pro as an example, if someone was to maliciously try to evade uh, validation, it's both client side and server side. So if it doesn't matter if it got by client side, server side also stops it. Um, so <clears throat> yes, you could build, you could probably build other validation if you wanted to that's JavaScript based on the client front end. But there's nothing built into the system that says create custom validations, if that makes sense. Here, though, would be my question. <coughs> Being that it's not <coughs> SQL-driven, it's not a 
real database. There's no, eh, it's, a, it's, it's a database over there. I mean, that you can't access in any way but this system. Correct. So my question, what, are the, what would be the dangers of, of, of somebody puts, you know, Johnny Drop Table's concept doesn't <laughs> exist here. You can't delete my data because this thing doesn't have, you know, code that you could put in as your name. There, there so are there's some, not like injection. Uh, there are some levels I, of that kind of stuff. That's, that's what yeah, I, I, I sure. want to you know wonder. <clears throat> well, so um, I'll come back to it when we get into the, the data types specifically, um, because we're, we're we're kind of heading into there um, in the next couple of screens. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of an intro into the content types, and then we're talking about the visualizers, and and then we'll dive into that. But uh, you know, kind of going into a content type. The article is the example one that I was going through earlier, um, and that's the one I'm going to follow through as we as we go through examples. Um, but just to say, when you edit a content type, if that content type already has data uh, applied to it, then there's some things you can't change, and you can't make more changes because you already have data in there. Um, so some of the things that you know I, I have screens on here, uh, it actually won't let me finish editing because I've already got data in place, but just to show an example of an article, we normally have certain fields that we put in place whenever we're doing article related work, and that is the same whether I am building an article manager in XMOD Pro, or I'm using an article module like uh, ZLDNN article modules when we use fairly often enough, um, or here in Liquid Content, and those are fields like title and, or headline and subheadline, or title and subtitle, um, author, short description, long description or body content, um, call out quote, image, you know, primary image, caption for the image, attribution for the image. Those are all fields that I would want to create with any kind of article regardless of what system that, that we're working in. So that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that's created here inside of Liquid Content. So I clicked on an item here just to show that you can, you can duplicate it and copy more fields. If you want to keep on working on that content type, you can delete a question. This is the interface that Liquid Content has for you to work within to create these, uh, these custom fields that you can have as part of this content type. Um, when we were talking about the types of fields that were available, uh, there aren't a tremendous amount of those. So I'm going to kind of focus on those for just a moment. Um, you have the ability to make single line text or multi line text. That's your text field versus your text area. Pretty simple. Um, you can have one that is HTML related or just simple uh, text related, either one. Uh, you have a number or a numeric field. You have multiple choice. Multiple choice then is uh, check boxes and radio buttons and multi selects and single selects for you to have as, as your multiple choices. Is there a significance to like the fact that that icon looks like that would be a drop down? No, num number is, is saying that it's a, it's a, it's a single line of text, but type. it's, it's um, set as a data type of number. So in the field, it will give you ups and downs um, inside of there to go oh, up and down. I don't really know. <laughs> um, date time is another field. Um, and then uh, static text. <coughs> static text is your way to, in your data type, set up instructions that are going to be visible in the form. So if someone is editing that, you can have a paragraph that describes what the next set of several fields are. Like, um, labels and information in your in your form for when people are editing this. Now the other two are assets and reference objects. Assets are videos and pictures um, and documents and an ability to upload things. So you think of your assets as your items that can be uploaded and your things that can be selected. References are references to other sets of data. So when I talk about making proper data structure and having cross references, that's where I think of our reference objects and having them relate to other sets of data. So in this particular client example, um, we're going to talk about an article where they wanted to have data come through liquid content and they wanted to have an article and some widgets. Those widgets are off to the side of their article and they are services that they're promoting. And they'll normally have one or two or four widgets on the side of all of their articles. And when they're consuming their, uh, their content out of the API, they didn't want to just get the article. They're thinking of it as a whole page of content. They wanted to get the article and the three <coughs> widgets that were assigned to that article. 
So we're going to talk about that and how that's accomplished in, um, in liquid content, and then we're going to talk about how that's accomplished uh, in community because that's an important distinction. So here, if we talk about these, um, you know, these references, we have over here uh, a you know, right, right rail, uh, right side widget. So uh, first widget, second widget, third widget, they had up to four widgets where you could call or reference another set of data. So when we look back at our content types, there's another content type there that is called article widget or sidebar widget so that you can then have these things multipurpose all over the place. Who knows, maybe in a mobile application they had nothing but swiping left and right to see all the widgets. That's fine, that's a reuse or repurposing of that content, but it can also show up on the sidebar inside of your website to have these other widgets. And if you're thinking ahead in terms of data, that is a separate table of data with separate records and cross-references between the these articles. Widgets, it's just like content. There's the, you like know, a their word. chunk of content. Um, the word widget here could be the word purple bunny feet. Um, it's just the text label uh, that or is meant to be or, you know, <laughs> ads or related content right. or yeah, anything else. But so these, um, these sidebar uh, widgets are one of, the, one of the points that we'll, we'll talk about in, in pretty good detail. Um, but going into an example of a piece of data, if I look at a title here and I look at the specific data about this title, we can see that this is... Uh, some of the basic settings that you have for the title. It's very simple. You put in the text for the label. Um, you can give it a default value if you want to. Um, you can have a description show up underneath of the field, or you don't have to have a description show up underneath of the field. That's your, uh, that's your choice. Um, and then we have some um, basic, basic validation. So we can have uh, the fact of whether a field is required or not. We can have some validation in place um, so that we can uh, control some things like a limit, you know, the, the, the top number of character limits uh, that we have. There are some more, um, you know, validation elements, uh, but it's, it's pretty basic. Um, so uh, if I look at some other fields just to show you what those options are and, and what are around them, if I look at something like this, it's a, a drop down because this is one of the multiple choice uh, items. We can see that we have multiple choice on drop down for dates, and then we have some options like hide date, show date published, or show both date published. Uh, these are the options that are created inside of there, and if you want to add more choices, you just click and add more options to the drop down. Um, you can choose whether it's a multi select or single select, um, and you know here it's a drop down versus check boxes versus radio buttons. So it's a pretty intuitive form builder. As form builders go, having worked with Mandeeps and Dean and Sharp and, and Active Forms and um, Form Master and Xbox Pro and I, I mean I, I that's, that's not a full list that's like eight and I could probably keep on going for another five or six form builders um, probably only excluding forms and lists um, then uh, this is a pretty good form builder this, this allows you very easily. Uh, to build and lay things out. Uh, also, the ability to then move the fields around, which you've chosen them, to slide them around and move them to different positions and decide are they going to fill up the whole width of the screen or only fill up a third or a half is pretty intuitive uh, for you to work within and, uh, and lay out what you're doing for your, for your form fields. Um, you know, talking about the reference uh, section, I do want to, no, I don't have more on that. Um, I do want to point out that when you do a reference, like here I'm selecting this right rail widget, um, to say that uh, when you choose a reference to something, uh, then you're able to decide what it's going to connect to. And here, uh, you know, this is connecting to these, uh, these widgets, and I'll show you that uh, as another data type here in just a moment. So um, moving on past content types. If content types is your ability to create your different sets of data and the forms that are going to be managing those are what are built when you set up the field of the data. It's kind of beautiful in that you're building it all at one time and uh, it's, it's done. Once you press save on a content type, you've already built the editing forms, you've already built the instructions, it's all there in one, and it's got the, the fields that are present in the data at the same time. Visualizers <clears throat> is your ability in liquid content to display what you've built, your content types, to display inside of a .NET new page. Visualizers do not have anything to do with display of that content once it's gone through the API or once you're reading it from the API. 
Think of the visualizer as your first consumer of your API data. It's your first consumer that happens to live on your .NET Nuke website. Some people who use liquid content don't worry about visualizers. They don't build any visualizers because all they're doing is using DNN to allow them to manage the data that then is going to be pushed out through the API to multiple different receiving sources. A website in another content management system pulling from the API, a mobile uh, application that is pulling um, you know, data into the mobile application, um, you know, pager and update systems that are sending to your mobile watch and to all kinds of other little IoT devices. Whatever you've got that's reading the API, those are other consumers of that data. Your liquid content visualizer is one of the consumers of that data. And um, when we later talk about examples within the community, if content types were your forms and your ability to, to be editing the content data, visualizers is your templates. It's your display of that data. Um, out of the box, to really help with some of the examples of that, um, liquid content comes with several visualizers that are already built for you to test with, to play around with. And uh, to some extent, they help teach you what you're doing with the visualizers, and they're a nice uh, intro from that respect. But if we say that we are editing uh, one of them, I'm going to choose here one of the ones that comes default, which is like the circle uh, type templates that's available in visualizers. So this is circle image right <coughs> that I am um, you're bringing up. To begin with, you have a name for it and a description. Those are your internal names and descriptions. They really don't show up anywhere else. Uh, there's an ability to set an icon so that if these look different from each other, you can visually tell them apart pretty quickly. Um, you connect them to a content type. So every visualizer is connected to a content type. Uh, it'd be nice if you could use the same visualizer across multiple different content types, uh, but you really can't. So you, um, you end up selecting it to, to a content type. Um, so aside from you know, some setup work to start off the details of that, you can get in to edit these, um, these visualizers. And I'll, I'll zoom in so that we can talk about the parts of things that you could create in your visualizers. And this is a very common idea of how to put these together. So liquid content, you know, you know created here in, in 2017. I looked at Clint like, for validation. So no, really? when, when was liquid Yeah, liquid content, 2017, end of 2016? I don't know exactly when. I mean, it was before I rejoined, so yeah, that'd be... I, I have to look that up. That blog about. I have to look that up to, to mention uh, officially, but um, it's a fairly new release, and this is a fairly straightforward presentation style in that um, you have the things that are going to make up what is presented on screen. Um, to begin with, you have your template. Your template is your display of your content that's coming out of the liquid content data. There are tokens that allow you to display the fields that you've created, and then the rest of it is just HTML. There's no .NET here. There's nothing fancy if you don't want there to be. You can put together just straightforward HTML and do that alone, um, and you'll be just fine creating visualizers. There are other advanced um, bits of code that you can put in place for if-else statements and conditional statements and things like that. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty basic, straightforward presentation. And, and within templates, you have three parts to a template. You have your template, which is the middle piece. You have your header, and you have your footer. The difference here is that your header will display once. And if you have a visual uh, visualizer that is a list that is going to go through and loop and repeat things, you have your header, which is going to be displayed and re uh, record set put out once. And then you have your footer, which is going to be put out once. And the piece in the middle, your template, is going to be the item that loops in between. Um, so uh, getting back to the template, um, if you have a, uh, you know, here in this example, if you have a div um, that is then going to have an image and then a block of content with a first name and a last name and then some links to email addresses and things and then a bio and then you close out those divs. If you have a list presentation of this visualizer with 13 people, then this template piece is going to iterate 13 times for the result set, whereas the header only will start in the beginning and the footer will start at the or will show up at the end. So I, you have to write code to get that part? Because I, I thought it was going to be just as visual to do the front, the, uh, the display, and no. the forms. Um, this, is, this is very uh, hands-on code to do the visualizers. Um, so we've looked at one piece, which is the template. 
Um, but then there are two other pieces, um, and that basically you have um, your three parts of your template. Uh, you then also have style, which allows you to put in CSS elements that relate to this specific visualizer and what's mm -hmm. going to be presented for this visualizer. And then you have a script, and that is JavaScript that is going to be loaded for this specific visualizer. Now, sometimes you can consider your script and your CSS, and you can think, well, why don't I take that and put it just into my skin? Put that into my main website so that it'll just be present all the time. And that might make sense. There might be reasons to put JavaScript into the skin and to put um, styles into the style sheet of the website, but if this module, if this visualizer isn't used on every page of your website, then you've presented stuff that isn't going to be used on every bit of your website, and if you put it here, it's going to be loaded when that visualizer is present on a page. David? I thought I was in school for a second. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, do you happen to know what, what JavaScript version this supports? Is it pure JavaScript? Is it modern JavaScript? Is yeah, it's it jQuery. Is it JavaScript or is it? I do not know the answer. I know what I've stuck in and what works. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't put in code that hasn't worked. So um, I don't know. I should find that out. Or if someone else is online uh, that knows better than me, we can we can get that answer. So this uses that dot list of syntax. So I was wondering, like, what is this really we're looking at? Is it really JavaScript or is it? Well, I mean, it's inside of the editor, like you get all those suggestions and stuff. <laughs> It's a JavaScript syntax. I mean, I don't know what version of JavaScript it is, but you could do some pretty neat stuff with it. And I'm not even like schooled up on it all. Like, so on the DNS software side, yep, the partner directory, um, the MVP page, and what else? You, the, the showcase. Community. You know, the the MVP, uh, the MVP, the um, the partner directory was some of my first. Um, experience with seeing liquid content that other people put together. Yeah. And, and I hadn't really seen it, but instantly I knew what you were doing and <coughs> you were doing it with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not do, I did the MVP, uh, Chad, the sales engineer, did the partner directly, mm -hmm. and it's, I mean, it's, pr it's pretty good. I mean, for what for what it is, I mean, it's a lot of content, a lot of like oh my goodness. filtering and stuff. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and she realized it's 8 o'clock. Man. We're going to be here for four hours. I don't know. That's, that's for when you have the full session. Yeah, right, right. right. It's got to be another half hour. Half hour, right, right, right. Man. No, but I got the good <laughs> stuff coming. No, no, it's really good. Yes, okay, good. so um, let, let's kind of move on from the visualizers. Um, API keys, uh, this is your ability to get your API key. We'll talk about it in Postman in a second, but that's where you go to get. Uh, you, you have to give your API key when you want to get the data out of, your, um, out of the DNN uh, API. Okay, so visualizers. When we talk about putting a visualizer on a page, I want to show that so that we can talk about it and we're, we're going to get into the details of it. But um, you add it onto a page just like a normal module. Um, again, here, this is for you to use your liquid content in your DNN website. But that's not always people's point. But if you do um, want to use it internal, I have a, a, a favorite use for the visualizers that out of the box solves a problem that I mentioned uh, earlier if you were paying attention. So um, I'm going to add a visualizer to a page here. Uh, when you do add a visualizer, you are first presented with a filter. Re really this is a filter to show you which visualizers you have the ability to choose between. So are you going to be spitting out one piece of data, that's a content item, are you going to be spitting out a list of records, so you're going to iterate through a loop, and when you click to see details, there's a potential that that visualizer isn't going to take you to a different page. It's not going to load the page again. It's going to, inside of that one visualizer, switch to a detailed view. And then when you click back, switch back to the list view. So that's list and detail all in one. Um, or that is list or that is detail. So if you do list, it's just a list of stuff. If you do detail, uh, then it's that, um, that list, uh, I'm sorry, that, that single item of, of data. Once you choose one of these, you're presented with your content type to say, okay, now we know what you're trying to get out. Which of the content types are you trying to pull data from? Notice that you can't choose multiple here. You're just choosing a piece of data. I'm going to choose um, that I want to get article data. So at that point, we have one um, you know, visualizer here that's a dashboard list um, that we're going to put on the page. 
The next screen, so there are a lot of little steps to sticking a module on a page, but this screen allows you to see a preview of what you would be seeing from this data set being pulled out into this, uh, into this visualizer. Mm -hmm. This is also your ability to put in some filtering so that this will show the data you want it to. If you do nothing, it'll show all of the data. But you have an ability to say that you want to sort the data. Let me zoom in just a second. You have the ability to sort the data and say you want to sort it by created date descending or created date ascending. You can um, you know, choose how much is going to be showing uh, as far as data records are concerned. But more importantly, you can filter by tags. Tags is a concept that inside of liquid content allows you to filter data down to certain subsets. And whereas we will often do this with categories or data, you know, um, values of data and, and, and different pieces that are in the data, tags are almost like keywords that are internal only, but they are a big way that liquid content allows you to get stuff out of the API specific to a set of tags and show stuff in the visualizers specific to a set of tags. So think of it as keyword-based um, filtering that you then, if you put it in when you're entering the data, you have as an ability to filter when you're taking data back out. And that, that's how we do every partner page on the site. The they, tag. Yeah, you filter by the tag, like we associate mm -hmm. a tag with the partner name. Yep. And then, you know, to, to be very specific on that, that's because that's the only way you can filter in liquid content. You so are technically categories. This encompasses every kind of this is true. architectural hierarchy you would the want. The biggest and most important way that you can filter content is with tags. You really don't have a lot of other options to filter. But like tags is the main one. Setting up other things that you can reference. Yep. Could it be as simple as referencing a, a list of things that are categories? Yes. Yes, you can. And then somehow, you know, build a different you know, uh, visualizer that would let you choose that one and that passes a URL query string to yes. a visualizer that sure. you just the list of the articles in that category. But if you're thinking about only getting the data out of an API and getting data from the API, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, we'll, we'll come to that as, as one of the pain points uh, in a minute. So we're still here on the screen. Uh, we haven't even added this module to a page yet. Um, but I did want to point out the filtering and the, the information here. We spit it out onto a page. It's not very pretty. It's just set up as, as, a, as a list um, so we can see information. This was uh, an example to say, okay, can we spit this information out about these articles with the intent of making a dashboard? So that then on this dashboard, we could say, show me all the articles by this author, show me articles by XYZ. Mm -hmm. uh, and inside of the visualizer, we could put in filtering, we could put in um, all kinds of other pieces. Um, two, though, when you think about editing your records, if I said that before that little tiny persona bar expanded area is your only way to edit your content, you can also edit, a con edit the content from a visualizer. Mm -hmm. So one of the tips and tricks that I like to suggest is that once you do have a visualizer on a page, even if you don't care what it looks like, you have this managed content link. And this managed content link, oh man, okay, I have to go back to my screens. Let me see if there's one more over. Nope. Your managed content gives you back this, um, this previous view um, so that you have this view so that you can edit content and it's in a bigger, more full screen type of space. So if you are hampered by having that tiny little area, uh, then you have this much larger area, including the ability to filter right here on a much larger uh, screen thing that can be full screen. So um, that's one of my tips is, is you know, setting up a dashboard widget, or I'm sorry, a dashboard visualizer, uh, just to be able to look through and get, get to your content. Yeah, potentially that might also be important for giving editing abilities to non admin users. You give them access to see this page, but they can't get into the, into the uh, persona bar. I would say no. There are other things for that. Okay. Because when you're talking about evoke, you have multiple different con uh, role types including content editors and an ability to make them able to see the... Yeah, the, there are different ways to handle that. Okay. Well, so in our example here, uh, to kind of wrap up the things that we're talking about for the persona, I'm sorry, for the evoke uh, liquid content side of things, um, I want to describe some things about a, uh, a use case. Uh, in this use case, we uh, are describing a, an article in which there is the content of the article that in the body of the article is all about an article content type. The title, the picture, the descriptions, uh, the footer links, who it's by, what category it's in. That's all the article content. We also then talk about other reusable content type 
content um, being these sidebar widgets. So here's this example of four different widgets that are on the side of the thing. If we are talking about consuming all of this data at the same time, we don't have a way to do that in the API, but heading over to the API is where we're, where we're going next to talk about things. So um, I'll come back to this as the point of one you know, point of, uh, of restriction that you can't do in, in liquid content, that you can do it external, um, and that is one of the you know, compare and contrast examples here of a limitation that's present. But um, if we take a look at the API, when we are reading data that we're wanting to consume out of your liquid content um, managed information, uh, you're going to be going to dnnapi.com uh, to get to that content. And one of the first uh, things that out of the documentation center I like to load up when I'm playing around with the content is just a query to see all of the different content types. Um, actually, I'm here on uh, content items, but content types is one of the first queries that I like to run because it gives me all the different content types that are available and the GUIDs that are the primary IDs for each of these content types because we need to use those later on uh, for certain types of stuff. So I'll, I'll kind of talk about that too here in just a second. Right, because you didn't get to define any kind of a key. A key, things. right, right. So um, running these uh, content type uh, APIs, you know, basically when you run this, you can run a very simple get uh, type of query, which just gets everything so that you can understand what all of your different content types are. If you want to get information about a specific <laughs> content type, then you can pass it in by ID. And if you're passing it in by ID, it's that GUI that you're, that you're using. So to some extent, you run one to help get you the other so that you can see what those, what those things are. Um, but, uh, you know, when we're talking about fetching your data, fetching the stuff that you want to present in a mobile application or in an external, you know, consumption or use, uh, most often you're talking about the get published content items and get published content items with an array, uh, an ID array. Uh, so these are the primary two that I end up using to, to pull data and to display that. And um, we're, we're going to look at a couple of examples of those. Um, you can also um, obviously put data up through the API and submit records and submit information. So it's not just about reading, uh, it's also about uh, publishing as well. But um, jumping right into Postman, um, we're going to look at some of, these, uh, some of these things to see the data and see the, the records that are being returned by these. Um, because in Postman, you can kind of see that you're, you're going and you're hitting your dnnapi.com your content API, uh, content items. And if you're just doing a straight pull request, or maybe get, uh, for content items, you're going to get everything that is inside of liquid content. And so in this example here of just getting everything, um, I end up getting uh, content types. Uh, I end up getting you know, something like you know, two or 300 records because of the number of articles that have been put in and sidebar widgets and all of these items. So if you're just getting everything without being specific about what you're getting, uh, then you get a little bit of everything that's uh, in the system. It's a good way for you to check data. It's a good way for you to see everything that's present, uh, but it's pretty simple uh, to get, just fetch and get everything. Um, sometimes you could use that to then in your own system, filter it down, do something with that data, um, but I don't really see a practical reason to get everything all of the time. Most often you want to get something very specific. Um, so showing a little bit about those content types. Each content type, when you do a request for content types, uh, does have that GUID as an ID. So here if we're taking a look at uh, content type um, that is the BBS article, we can see that the BBS article um, content type has a, a GUID for an ID. And so later I'm able to use that specific GUID so that I can specifically call just the BBS article if I wanted to call that information. So if I take a look and say here, inside of Postman again, that I want to get the published content items specifically by content type ID, this GUID, then I know I'm just getting my articles out uh, when I want to get this data. Uh, so here I am then seeing that my results that come out are all of these articles. We get the name of the article, the description, the tags, uh, the details, the author, the image. All of those things that are part of our content type are going to be present, uh, presented here inside of our um, API set of results. All right. 
So um, in using this, let's see where I'm going next. Okay, in using this, I'm going to kind of uh, finish by saying uh, a little bit of uh, one of the things that's a, a, an ending point that I want to uh, show in liquid content before I move on to the ultimate and community side. Uh, and it's that when you have more complex things going on inside of your content types, inside of your data, you're going to run into some limitations with what can be done with the APIs. Because if we were talking about the APIs having a specific request for a set of data, you don't have an ability to create an aggregated set of data. You don't have an ability to get, like if you were doing a SQL query and say, I want to get all uh, of the articles, and because I have these three sidebar widgets, I also want to get these sidebar widgets out of a different data set or a different table and get that all into one data set. You can't do joins, you can't do a more complex type of aggregation of data together that you normally do in SQL. You know, without thinking about it, you're dealing with the API uh, queries that have been created and exist to date. So if we take a look at if we take a look at what is present, we have the ability to use uh, content-related queries. Whether we're talking about all the content or we're talking about published content, these are the very specific uh, API queries that we're able to call. If we want to call things about content types, we can do those as well. But this handful of APIs is the, it is the limiting factor of what you can do inside of liquid content. If there is something you want to do and you can't get it out with one of these APIs, then you have to get creative about it. So if you need, uh, like this particular uh, client use case example uh, is describing, if you need to get out a page of content that has multiple different content types in it, you can't do that through one call to an API. Instead, you're going to do multiple calls to an API, and then on your receiving end, whatever you're consuming with, there you're going to pull it together and then display it all on one page or display it all on one thing. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, so I'm getting ready to head into community, and then we're going to do some compare and contrast as we, as we get out of it. Um, any questions in the group? We kind of got quiet there in the, the last little bit. Not at all. Okay. People still awake, or we got crickets? Andrew left, so I calmed down. <laughs> okay. The haggler stopped haggling. <laughs> um, well, I'll kind of finish that point uh, here with some of the postman things to say that if you are doing a request for a specific article, and you're saying, okay, I want to get that specific article, because we're getting that article by ID. So I am getting a very specific article that has five reasons to celebrate uh, X, Y, Z. We can see the title. We can see the image. We can see the body content. But if we scroll down to the bottom of this, we're going to see that the reference that you are given when you request that one article, and you have cross-references, which is great. Have those cross-references. In this case, uh, the categories or the related widgets. Here, this article is related to two widgets, and it's part of two different categories. The way that's returned to us in the Liquid Content API is we get an array list of the GUIDs. So we have an array list of the two categories that this is part of, and we have the two related widgets that it is uh, there for. If you want to then get that category name or information about the category, you have to do another call back out again to the API to request information about these two um, GUIDs. If you want to get the widgets because you want to display them on the page next to the article, you have to do two more calls or a call with an array to uh, fetch the content of these widgets and then display them. So if you're thinking about this from the you know, perspective of the, the, the thing that they're building to consume, that thing has to be able to read, process, and then put back out requests and process again. So you're going to have to have something that's doing some heavy lifting there to put together the individual items that are coming back from, uh, from the API and those requests. Um, okay, so we get into the community side of things, and you do have a question now. So is, is there any versioning with the content types and templates? No. 
Not that I'm aware of. I'm kind of looking over to David or to you to, to see. No, not that I'm aware of. Um, one example of something that I, I've had to explain to people about a difference between module content, where people are familiar with the HTML module or the HTML Pro module, and liquid content is that if you make a mistake in HTML Pro with a module on a page, you can roll back and you can see versioning and you can see who was the last person to make edits and changes. That is specific to the HTML Pro module. That's not inherent to the DNN itself as a concept. So if you have third-party modules, they may or may not have versioning. It just depends on what's built into the third-party modules. It's the same thing with liquid content. Um, there's no versioning uh, inherently that's built into liquid content. Um, so there's no uh, ability to roll back or, or do any of those things that you're familiar with doing in HTML Pro. Um, but, uh, you know, here just gauging the amount of time that I'm spending talking about things, it's 8.15. I'm going to jump into community side of things, and I'll go as long as you guys feel like it's not dragging on and you're not trying to chew your foot off to get out of here, right? Um, but I'll go quicker. Um, so, community side. If you're going to build the exact same thing in community, I've already said you can use lots of different tools to do this. Uh, myself here, uh, personally, I'm going to be using um, DNN Sharp's Endpoint API to build the API. And the editing and display, if we do it inside of the DNN website, is uh, done with Xmod Pro. And that also helps us build the data and build the fields and things. So to some, some extent, DNN Endpoint API is going to be taking the part or playing the role of API uh, creator and generator. Um, Xmon Pro is going to be the data creator and generator and manager um, elements. So uh, here we look at the exact same thing now put together with Xmon Pro for a visualizer uh, equivalent um, here. And if we imagine how the visualizer had the structure of a template with a header and a footer and looping through sets of information and then a section for style and a section for script, that is a direct equivalent to what we have inside of Xmod Pro. Uh, Xmod Pro was released, the Pro version of Xmod Pro was released originally in 2009, I believe. So uh, when, when you see those similar types of things here, they, they've been around for quite a long time. But if I go into edit mode, the same thing that we were looking at as a visualizer where we did build it all in one, you could build it in separate pieces, but um, is done with Xmon Pro and this is what it looks like on the screen with Xmon Pro. Um, the very top bar is your control panel bar where you can see what form has been set up for this module instance and what template has been set up for this module instance. And going into any of those gets you to edit the code uh, that's in those forms or in that template. Um, but on the screen, it can be made to look exactly the same as what we were uh, looking at inside of um, liquid content. Here in that example, if I'm taking a look at a template, um, it's similar, but it's different. Uh, so we have a header section of code that can include style, JavaScript, and other items that you want to appear only once. Uh, so that's inside of the code. That's a header template. And then you have your item template and your footer template. So those are pretty toe-to-toe, one-to-one um, examples. And again, with x Pro being around in this sense since 2009, um, my first impression of liquid content was, oh, hey, this is really easy to understand because it looks just like Xmon Pro. Um, you get down to the body, uh, and that body inside of the item template is the thing that is going to loop. That is your element that is going to loop um, inside, of your, uh, your, inside of your template display. If I, look, uh, if I look at the same time, we build managers often so that people can see the data or see the records uh, that you are putting into your your structured content, your, your data that, again, in this instance, inside of DNN community, we're saving the data inside of the SQL database. So um, Dustin stepped out, but one of the things that he'll point to is that he's not restricted at how he accesses and works with his data. Um, you know, he has some concerns with liquid content that he only can work through the APIs to get the data versus working in them here inside of a, a DNN website or working inside of the uh, DNN SQL window or working inside of SQL Manager just to go directly to connect to that database and, and data structure. So um, there is a much wider um, set of access that you have when you're dealing with traditional data that's stored in your DNN database um, when you're dealing with something like Xmon Pro. 
but we often will build managers so that you can see what's on the screen and within those managers we'll build a lot of functionality so um, often it's more than just being able to see a record and then click to edit it We'll allow you to search them, sort them. We'll put in some checkboxes to quickly make things active or make things inactive or approved. Um, so there are a lot of features that we, we try to add into the managers, as well as the cross-references and being able to manage cross-references in a quick way. So if we have categories, for instance, uh, we have a, a category manager that allows you to, that we set up that allows you to quickly see all those categories. Um, here, you know, as an example, when we get into data, um, that cross-reference of these widgets would be set up as a separate table and you'd be able to see them, see some visuals for them, so more than just seeing them as a list that's inside of Liquid Content, you can do anything you want when you're doing it in, in a system like Xmon Pro. So it's the title, it's the ability to edit and delete, it's also links to the things so you can go see it, it's checkboxes for active, it's pictures and showing them. So you can completely customize what display you want to have. So if you're thinking about managing your customer experience, if all they have is liquid content, then they see text and they see a very simple, minim uh, minimal presentation when they're going through to review their records and they're clicking more to go get through more of them. You, if you want more than that, you're able to customize and do anything you want when you're doing it community side and with things like Xmon Pro. Um, we have some of our other um, uh, cross-reference tables here that are just straight data uh, that we're saving, again, as a good structure and a normalized data uh, database and approach to content. Um, so getting into the inside of Xmon Pro, when you have it on a page, you can go to the control panel and that allows you to manage the forms, manage the templates, manage feeds, and, and work with the database. This is kind of your equivalent of being inside of liquid content and saying, okay, what do I want to do? What do I have here? Your data types equivalent would be really setting up your forms because that's your ability to edit any of the, uh, of the records and the fields that you want to have available to people. Templates is your equivalent of your visualizers, so your ability to see data and present it on the screen um, as a single detail or as a looping list. Um, feeds is an interesting element that's unique to Xmon Pro that I'm aware of, um, and that's your ability to have a template displayed outside of or apart from the .NET Nuke interface. So if you have a looping list of articles that you need to display on a page, you're going to put it into a template. That template's going to go into a module on a DNN page, so you have your skin controlling the theme styling of what's inside of your template. But if you need to produce an RSS feed that is just data, and it's got to have XML format, you'd use a feed, because that allows DNN to serve up that data, but it's not inside of a skin, it's not on a page, it's just raw data in format. So if you need to serve up hard-coded APIs or queries that you can do with query strings, then you can set up JSON feeds, you can set up RSS feeds, um, but you can also set up other things that are not DNN pages. You can create uh, Excel files, you can create data that's going to go to uh, be generated as a PDF, uh, you can generate uh, video playlists uh, that are going to be consumed by media players. Again, your feed is the idea of a template, just as data alone. So on its own, and that is a way to produce data that can go out um, that isn't API related, it's just data related. Um, and then you have your database tools. So if I go to take a look at you know, a few of these, um, we'll do a little quick dive into these. If I look at an editor screen um, where I'm editing an article, the same type of thing that we talked about in content types is present inside of Xmon Pro, it's just handled a little differently. Uh, there are two ways that you make forms inside of Xmon Pro. Um, one of them is that you use a form builder uh, and form wizard. So you come in and you choose your .NET table. It shows you the tables that are in the DNN database. Um, you choose a particular one, and from there you're able to choose key fields that you want to have available, and uh, you then say create, and it generates the code for you. At that point, you can begin working on your code. So it's pretty quick and simple to quickly jump in and you are going to work in code. You have to know code, but you don't have to put it all together manually. It's there uh, to begin with and you can say based on these data types, bam, here's all the information out of the database. Um, similarly, there's a way to do it with a visual um, way. So that you choose the same selections of a database table and what fields you want to have present and then you say auto create. And then at that point you are given a visual way 
that you can see these form fields and you can drag and drop and modify the validation and choose different options for those things. So when you're building an XMOD Pro forms at least, there's a code based way to, to auto build and there's a visual way to auto build and you can move kind of back and forth between the two of those. Um, Templates is all code and you have to produce uh, those things, uh, but again, you can choose your table and then you'll spit out a starter for you to work from. Um, you can start making forms and start making templates and be ready to start working in them in four seconds flat as long as you build your database tables first. Building data first is the smart way to go in XMOD Pro. You can go the other way around, you're just doing everything manually. You build the data first, it's blazingly fast. Um, to help with that, there is a database tool. This is not a replacement to um, you know, SQL Server uh, manager so that you can go into Management Studio and really work on your database, but in a pinch. And if you are someone who doesn't have direct access to the database, you can come here and you can create a brand new database table and you can then create several new columns uh, to create your uh, data tables first before you then go backwards to work on forms and templates and stuff. So uh, from that standpoint, Xmon Pro is a good toe-to-toe -to -toe example of what we're talking about with liquid content, because liquid content creates the data tables. It creates the forms. Here, Xmon Pro is creating those database tables, uh, allowing you to create the forms and then work with and manage those just as well. Um, so example there being, you kind of zoomed into creating things in tables. Virtually kind of the same, just in a different order, but I mean, you showed stuff about making Forms, forms from a table, yeah. not making a table from the form. I'll, I'll swap it around and I'll, I'll <laughs> make in presentation later, I will make database first and then I'll, uh, I'll go over to forms, uh, forms next. Um, so, um, you know, jumping into the other part of things. Xmon Pro is used to make your forms so you can edit your data. You can use it to create your database tables. Let's talk about the other side of things, which is using um, DNN Sharp's Endpoint API module to create your API that you're going to be consuming. In this situation, um, I'm jumping right into uh, you know a, an instance of the Endpoint API in a site, and we are taking a look at a few different APIs that have been created. So here, underneath the methods, you can see that we've created four different um, four different APIs, and uh, we have API keys and license and some other stuff. We'll, we'll talk about but you know jumping into these one example of why this is useful is to get around the problem that we talked about a, a minute ago let's see if I have that as a screen no, I don't. Um, you know to get around the problem that we talked about a minute ago which is that in this client example they wanted to use one API to get the whole page of content but the whole page of content was an article and four widgets on the side there's no liquid content API that lets you get both at the same time. So you could do API aggregation, which is one of the links that I, I mentioned earlier, which is a concept. You can use some tools to do multiple different API calls, bring them together and concatenate and process them to spit back out one final API call. So there are ways to aggregate, but there are better ways that you can create a custom API to do exactly what you want. And that's what we've done here with uh, DNA Sharp's Endpoint API because we did an example of making an API that just got the body. That's an example of liquid content. Or just got the widgets. Again, example of liquid content. But we made another API where we got everything all at one time. Uh, so in this, we can see that we have the Endpoint uh, URL, which can have a friendly version. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we can see some things about this API that's been created. First off, we need to pass in an article ID so we can get um, just one particular article and see the details of this one, uh, um, um, one article uh, from the API. So the parameters are things you are passing in to the API when you make the request. Actions are the things that it's going to do as it spits back out the data, uh, including loading data out of SQL and then parsing it uh, into JSON uh, to spit back out. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Um, Going into edit, uh, we can see that the name of this is article detail full. It is a get uh, type API because we're going to be getting information versus posting it. 
Um, I have a brief description. It's enabled. Uh, we can put it into debug mode. There's some nice features inside of the module that lets you do stuff. Um, we can see already that input data-wise, we have one field that we're passing into this to make it simple for example sake. Um, and that is article ID. And so that one article ID is being passed in, and just to begin with, what we're passing in is one here. Um, the reason I, I kind of jumped to this at the bottom of the API is that DNN Employee API makes it simple for you to test and work on things without using Postman. We like Postman. We're going to bring up Postman. But if we just want to see the data, we don't have to leave um, our DNN site. We don't have to leave DNN Sharp Endpoint API. Um, we can do it from here. So we can pass in a number and we can look at some sample jQuery code that would allow us to take this code and drop it into a module on the website and we could see the data coming back if we wanted to do it that way. Otherwise, we can hit execute at the bottom of the, um, we can hit execute at the bottom of the um, window here and we can get a response and we can see right here an error if we haven't passed in the right data or if we have something wrong with the endpoint and it's not putting out the data in the right format or, or it's not matched up in JSON between JSON and SQL, then it'll give us an error message and say, hey, there's something broken. But if we click execute and we can see this data, we know we're in good shape uh, when we get to Postman. So um, let's take a look at the input data. Uh, so here, it's pretty simple. We're saying we're passing in the article ID. I have a bit of a reference so that you don't pass in the article ID. Uh, then we can spit back out some information. We can put out some error responses. Uh, and we can also have some validation in that. Um, so in our API, uh, when we're you know, taking in, if we're expecting numeric and we get in words, we can give some uh, validation responses uh, based on the type of information that's put in. If we get into the actions, we're getting into the real details of the API and what's been built. <clears throat> I'm starting backwards. I'm going to do the JSON part first, and then we're going to get to the SQL part, because the SQL part is the real brains. The JSON part is real simple. You're just doing a result set, which is all of your SQL results being spit out in a JSON result set. This isn't the only thing that you have to do with a, D, uh, with, with a DNN Sharp Endpoint API. You can do other actions when this runs, like send out a subsequent um, query to the database to look up something else, or to record the number of times that something has been done, or to make updates or changes in the database. We're showing in this is a simple example here of just reading data, but these, these can do multiple different things at one time. But this JSON entity is really your result set, and you can use the same basic one on every API that you set up if you want to. It can be a very, very basic thing where you're basically just putting in the entity name and spitting out the results, and that's it. Uh, when I set up you know, these examples, I just put in the word uh, article, and then I'm done with the JSON entity. It's pretty simple. It's the loading of the entities, the SQL query parts, that's the, uh, the brains of the <coughs> API because you are able to now use SQL. You're able to use the brains and the power that's been built into SQL for what it's been built for. So uh, here we're saying we want to load SQL data. <clears throat> and at that point, we are loading a SQL query. And that allows us to have as complex a SQL query as we want there to be, including having it be a stored procedure with a lot of information to it. Uh, I kind of expand the window here to show you that we're dealing with SQL that can be as complex as we want. So simple fields out of a table, of course, no problem. Additional um, subqueries and you know, select top X out of Y, this gives us the ability to select our widgets. So when we're calling this data, we can call the article and call four widgets at the same time. Um, so we've kind of got that uh, at the bottom of the SQL you do have to do some mapping. Every field that you want to have come out in your JSON has to be mapped. And this is doing kind of data entity mapping, and it's really so that you are uh, parameterizing what's coming out of SQL and putting it into JSON. So you are doing a match of anything that you want to have come out. You know, you may not have, you may have had more in the SQL query than you're actually using. That's perfectly fine. Every field that you want to come out in JSON is um, mentioned here. So you've got your SQL columns and your entity property. 
In this case, they're one to one because I'm just doing a, a you know, concept example. Right. It seems that that you should not have to do <coughs> anything for it to give you the default names of all of them back. This right. is a way outside of SQL to say I want to. You know, it's actually called this and such, but I want to put. You, you want to rename the label or have like the spaces in it. Or let's imagine that you're preparing an API for somebody who already has a system and they're looking for all of these specific fields mm. or specific data things. You could combine together and concatenate things yeah. and then have them come out as one value sure. that you spit out here. Right. You can rename little, values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like so so somebody had uh, A through Z as the name of their input fields in this table. Obviously you want to you know have your, your JSON template look better than that and be able to make some sense, so you go through and call it first name, last name, sure. you know, title, sure, sure, sure. company, right. etc. So, um, you're, you're doing your mapping there, you're doing this one time, it might be a little tedious to set up, but it's one time to set up what's going to go into your, your JSON specifically. But that is it. You know, when we set it up, if we're done there, we don't have to do anything else. Mm. But we can. We can do error messaging so that on certain conditions we can spit out different information uh, from the API and we can control what shows or what doesn't show. We can control the security of the API. When doing initial testing, we can just have it be public and open. Maybe the data that you're having uh, put out doesn't need a key for validation. That might be just fine, especially if all you're doing is reading data. But you also have some other specific restrictions that are really nice, like restricted to list. You could put in a list of domains that are able to request this API. No handshake needed, no key needed. If you're calling from this domain name, then you can get the results. Anybody else gets blocked because you're not in the list. So it's a very simple way to get to some, uh, some control or restriction. Uh, you also then have JWT so that you can do even more, um, more restriction and a proper handshake uh, beyond that. Um, so when you are consuming this API, uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a URL that you're going to consume. That is your DNN website's URL, slash desktop modules, slash DNN sharp, slash et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you are getting at the end the name of the API that you want to call and any variables that you want to pass in. So that you can put in, you know, method is article detail full. That's the name of this API. But then also uh, ampersand article equals one or ID equals GUID or whatever you have to pass into the API that you want. But it doesn't have to stay that big, long URL. That's fine in most cases. But with the additional um, elements from DNN Sharp, which is their, uh, their URL adapter, you can also condense this down to a friendly URL. So it could be website slash API slash the name of the API. So it could be uh, a much more short, uh, simple, clean version uh, if you want to use that. But that's it. You call your... Um, you, you call your API and you're getting your data out. So taking a look at what's next, I go into Postman and we see what we're looking at here. So this is our DNA <coughs> site giving us our API and we're passing in not only the API, uh, the specific API, but Oracle ID number one. At that point, we are given the JSON of our results. And if you don't see it coming, uh, the big the reveal then is within those results, you don't get just the GUIDs or IDs for those side widgets, you get the actual data of those widgets. So the concept here is that within the community solution, with building this stuff and building your own API, you are then able to concatenate data together, make more complex requests for data, do more logic on that data, and here we've solved a client issue where we're displaying all the content in one, uh, one JSON request, one API request to get the article and to get the specific data. So there we go. And I did finish by 838, and that's not bad. I kind of ran through the, uh, the community side of things much faster than I would have otherwise. Um, but um, in talking about the ideas here, let's kind of go back to the main liquid content screen. Um, so Smeltzer had to leave early, but he was impressed. Good, good. good, good. Yeah, he was uh, real excited about Xmont Pro. Oh, very good. But he'd used it for basic stuff before, but he didn't want some stuff. That, that, that is excellent to hear. Um, to me, um, when approaching a project where we know that we're going to have APIs to deliver data, the question comes down on what you're going to do with the data and who's going to be doing it, as in. 
if I know that I'm going to have content editors who are in charge of editing the content, editing the, the information that's going in, and they're familiar with DNN, and they are unsupported. They don't have a tech team behind them. They don't have developers who can work in more complex code behind them. Liquid content is going to do a good job at giving them an all-in-one solution, one place, one ability to set up things, and if they think about it and, and process it, they can create their own content types, they can set up their own new data, and they can start having that as an API to, uh, to give out to people to consume those bits of data. Um, if you need a basic API giving you basic sets of structured data, Liquid Content's going to do a great job at that, and it's going to do it in a simple interface that's all part of, uh, all part of Evoke. So I think there are, are several points in favor there of saying that it is a simple, good starter way to do structured content. Once you get to one or two or three use cases that start to buck up against the ceiling limit of what you can do in complexity with liquid content, that's when you realize you need to use something else. Um, the fact that you could install DNN Sharp's endpoint API on an Evoke instance, and you could start using APIs from there, that's great. Except we're talking about liquid content data being only accessible through those APIs only stored in what's on that DNN API. Yeah, well, so, <clears throat> your, well, your display only comes out in visualizers. You cannot use <clears throat> anything else to display on your DNN instance. And likewise, even if you install DNN endpoint API, it can't get to the data. It can only get to HTML modules or data that's inside of SQL. And so there's a divide. So really, once you start thinking about having content with API delivery that is more complex than what you can get out of liquid content, then there's, there's not necessarily a benefit. It might as well be produced in DNA community because it doesn't need that specific external content of liquid, uh, of liquid content. Another detractor uh, of liquid content that I hear from community folks is they are concerned about the data and where that is and where it's stored and what uh, structure there is around that. And um, what if you need to get it out? <clears throat> You can get it out in one big giant API query. Bam, boom, you get 200 records on one table. Um, no, you can also, you can do all content items and get everything from all of them. And it'll that's one of the other postman. Yeah, that's, that's one of the first ones, and, and you can get out 200 records, and boom, gives you everything. Now, but that's just to get it out if you wanted to export it, right? right. If you wanted yeah. to do something with it. It's a big query with a lot of data so if you've got hundreds of records. Now, slightly less but, than the data that comes out of WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the last point there, though, about the data is um, the data won't always be, or doesn't always have to be, in Liquid Contents, uh, Azure, Komodo, or whatever we're calling it. Um, uh, Cosmo. 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 There we go. <laughs> uh, that's the SSL certificate. Uh, Sorry, uh, Cosmo. Um, because um, at DNN Summit last year, um, Andy described that he would look forward to eventually having liquid content not only be stored inside of um, inside of the the data location, the Azure data location. And so um, there are some pull requests, there are some uh, issues that are out there that say we need to have a path to migrate away from uh, Azure and DB and eventually move it to something local. Yeah, and he said that was a great idea, but it would be really a lot of work to do, so it's not soon. <laughs> it it yeah. was mentioned it's and not out there in the road task, soon. but there are no specific plans. Like, if we could do it without having well, to really rewrite everything? Then, right. Yeah, they're trying to move it. Yeah. Well, so I, yeah. I mean, that, that request is coming from not just community, but also... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, very much so. Right. So, so I, mean, I, I kind of want to frame it that it's, it's a request that's out there, and so it is, <coughs> it is in future plans. Where that falls in the roadmap for timing is, uh, you know, is not known. Now, going back over to the community side of things, uh, you know, saying that we're going to look at these things from, um, you know, all these different tools of... Um, you know, DNA Sharp API and Xmon Pro and these different tools, you have a freedom and flexibility to do things the way you want to, i.e., instead of having a specific set of seven or eight APIs you can call, you can create your own. So you can create any number of APIs, and you can include the data that you want to have in them, um, and that's a powerful level. Um, additionally, 
you can do more with your forms and your validation. We talked about uh, you know, one of the limits being some very simple validation and some very simple form types. Uh, within XMOD Pro, for instance, uh, we have all kinds of different um, form fields that are available beyond just those standard ones. Like you can have a dual list that is a left and right dual list. You can have... Uh, yeah. And uh, so I've talked for 15 minutes too long and, and uh, had to go. You're, you're fine. <laughs> I, I just got to get back on. I've been counting for long. It was. <laughs> it really is like I'm, I'm, I'm still debating on my should I have <laughs> uh, uh, All right, guys. Well, uh, we are wrapping up here. My last bullet point you can catch uh, later on the blog points, but um, hopefully that's a good compare and contrast of uh, liquid content to community based things. Again, these tools that we use. They don't have to be these tools, but I highly recommend uh, both of these as we use them regularly and love working in them. Um, I'm going to swap screens and head back out to, um, and, and when I post the blog post for this, I will post my notes with some of the bullets, some of the tips and uh, you know, tricks and things that I noticed, as well as links to all the different pages and things that we were, we were looking at here uh, in that compare and contrast. Um, but... Uh, kind of wrapping it up, I, I guess, uh, trying to wrap up. Hopefully that's a good comparing contrast to show you that you can do it one way and another way, showing you what some of the limitations are in both, honestly. Um, and if you're coming to DNN Summit, I will have a presentation that puts this together uh, in an even shorter format of time. I was going to say, you know, we're going to do a deeper dive in the, in the uh, session. I'm like, the session is not no. two hours. Maybe it should be two or three sessions. Maybe, yeah, right. maybe yeah. I should submit multiple sessions and then you can catch the morning and the evening or day one and day two. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Lock it in. Um, <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, just trying to wrap up, and then we're going to uh, turn off here in just a second. But, any questions? Um, any questions from anybody in the community and, um, and folks online? While we're waiting for that to come in, yep. unless it's instantaneous, uh, I also have a question about one that I thought would have also been comparable and involved in this comparison. Uh -huh. I, I don't know what it was, but we've started using it on a project recently, and I was thinking it was going to be Endpoint API because that involves some direct SQL access, but at least the part that I saw, I had to step out for a minute, um, didn't seem like it had the form building stuff. Endpoint API doesn't build forms, XML okay, Pro. Just, right. Well, so what was that? Well, but you can use thing. action well, third, third thing. thing. There's very much like there's Liquid open. Web, but it has SQL access. There's, that's Action Grid from DNN Sharp. Okay. You, we, we have a project that we're doing right now that uses Action oh, Grid. So it's still from DNN Sharp. It's that's another correct. one of the products. Okay. That's yeah, and there's so it's all separately the forms nice and lists. And then for API, you when can you, separately have Endpoint API. When you look at the different module developers that are out there, everybody has built their own little silo. And mm -hmm. they've yeah. built out the functions in their own little silo. Right. So DNN Sharp has built forms and lists and URL providers, and they've built out their own little set of things. If you're a Mandeep's fan, Mandeep has built his own little silo of things. He has a form, he has a list, he has et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you used to like the um, uh, action modules from, um, I'm sorry, not action, uh, active. Um, we just mentioned his name earlier. Um, what, that in uh, yes, I mean, Data Springs? Yeah, Data, Data Springs. Thank you. I was uh, blocking on that. Data Springs had their own little silo of modules with all their different versions of things. Um, those are all possible. Too Sexy, to some extent, is its own little um, silo in itself because it has API built into it and it has um, forms and lists and, and things like that. So you can do these with multiple different types of modules. Da uh, David, anything from the community? Didn't see anything in chat. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating. I will uh, say that uh, we will see you again in October. The third Thursday of October is October the 18th, uh, and that will be our um, next user group meeting. Uh, I think by that point in time, we'll have some more DNN Summit uh, information that we can uh, talk about with some excitement, and um, we will announce shortly who our speaker is and what we're presenting on uh, that particular night. But Thank you very much to everybody who's joining us online after the fact. Thank you, everybody who joined us here in person. I really appreciate you being here. And we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and finish the meeting and turn off recording. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank Good night. You.